Hey, welcome to the show, to the Kima Navani Connection Show. I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Anas F. Halaji, uh, in short, Anas, on my show for the first time. I heard him the first time on Marty Ben's show, Tales from the Crypt, where he talked about, you know, energy market, oil market, disruptive technologies, Bitcoin in connection with that. So there's, uh, you know, a couple of uh, statements he made, which which really baffled me, uh, which I didn't know. And uh, uh, with it be, you know, the pricing of oil and how the revenues can be sort of uh, done in the oil business. Uh, but the, uh, the peak market, the, the oil peak market, is, is oil finite or not? These are the many questions I want to ask him. What about, you know, disruptive technologies uh, within the, uh, you know, combustion engine or uh, oil uh, conversion uh, technologies or transportation technologies? Have there been any, you know, technologies been bought off by the oil conglomerates? So uh, yeah, I want to talk to him, you know, about macroeconomics, geopolitics, and a lot, lots more digging into the rabbit hole. So uh, yeah, without further ado, let me know what you think, and if you have any questions afterward, uh, let me know. Please follow me on YouTube. Subscribe, please, on my YouTube channel, podcast platform. Follow me on Twitter, and uh, I'll put up all the, uh, the the resources and links in the show notes. So thanks much again, and hope you, you're gonna enjoy this. Dr. Anas F. Alhaji, thank you so much for coming on my show. How are you doing? You're welcome. I'm doing great. Yeah, listen to me, Anas. I mean, uh, to be honest, I've got to admit, I didn't know you before the interview, the talk you had with uh, Marty Bent on Tales from the Crypt. And I was, I was totally f- f- um, really surprised and, 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 and um, um, you know, uh, shocked on some, some of your statements because it was so, you know, it was so authentic and so deep, deeply insightful. So uh, let me just give my listeners, maybe uh, you can, you know, talk about a little bit yourself, your background, but you are uh, uh, Dr. Anas F. Halaji. You are a world-renowned energy market expert, researcher, author, and a speaker with more than 900 papers, articles, and columns uh, to your credit. Uh, you advise governments, companies, financial institutions, and investors on various energy markets issues. Uh, you focus on oil and gas markets outlook, energy geopolitics, energy security, and the impact of disruptive technologies on the supply and demand of energy. Now, I want to talk about to you, you know, about disruptive technology because you made a statement uh, during met uh, sure. during your talk. Um, so, and us. What is what is your real focus and why are you doing this? Since when did you start like doing this kind of uh, really uh, niche expertise? And uh, what maybe you can give maybe my listeners also a bigger picture on the oil and gas market. Uh, generally speaking, I uh, I was in uh, college when I took a course in petroleum economics, and uh, uh, it just kind of uh, a bulb basically kind of <laughs> lit up in my brain. That's really what I wanted to do. And I started since then, uh, never regretted being in the energy field. Uh, it's probably one of the most dynamic fields uh, people will ever uh, uh, study. Uh, and this will explain why, and this can kind of sound really funny, but it's going to just, uh, it, it, it's just very strange that many people who are uh, like petroleum engineers or geologists or etc., uh, all of them want to be uh, oil market analysts or energy markets. Uh, simply, it's not about money because you don't make that much money being an energy market analyst or oil market analyst. It's just like any other market. Uh, uh, but it is uh, never a dull moment. It's just the excitement and it probably what drew those people uh, to the field and, and leave their original field. Uh, and that's true. There is never a dull moment in the energy field, whether on the political side, the economic side, the technology side. Uh, it's just it an amazing area to, to be in. You know, my, my, my show is, of course, you know, f- focused on Bitcoin and it's all about, you know, absolute scarcity of scarcity, finite, you know, uh, uh, amount of Bitcoin. So when, we, when it comes to oil, I, I just want to know, is there some truth to that? Um, uh, allegedly, many decades ago, some uh, Russian scientists said that oil is actually, it, re- it recreates itself. Uh, now, how much oil is there really? I mean, is there really a, a is that like a, a scarce, finite uh, thing? Or is it something that, you know, uh, or how, how long, for how many years, decades or centuries 
can we have uh, oil and gas? Sure. Uh, the theory you mentioned basically is very common among the scientists in, in Russia. And that leads us to one philosophical point I don't want to delve into on whether oil basically is came from those plants and fossils and you know the idea of dinosaurs of course is not correct but uh, people say it probably because uh, it's, it's a nice story um, or it is created and and there is a big difference between the two if it's created or developed from organic materials uh, so uh, several uh, Russian uh, scholars over time and especially probably about 40 years ago uh, they come up with the idea that uh, this is not finite as some people think. Uh, regardless, when we talk about oil, we talk about two things here. We talk about peak oil production and we talk about peak oil demand. These are different from the end of oil. No one who is an expert in the field or know the field will ever mention the end of oil. Oil will never finish. But there is an idea out there that production will reach a peak and then starts declining simply because even if oil is reproduced over time, the rate of reproduction is way lower than the rate of extraction. And therefore, we are going to reach a peak and then it declines. And there is this theory which is called peak oil production and there are people who believe in it there are several books there are several uh, articles etc uh, uh, in it uh, it's been debunked several times and the reason why it's been debunked because all their forecasts were wrong now will ever we get to that point we don't know but all the historical evidence basically are against them the irony here is Oil was discovered in 1859 in Pennsylvania in the United States. People start talking about the, the end of oil, not the peak of oil production, the end of oil in 1860. And they've been talking about it since then. And those who wrote books on it, etc., I will uh, tell you a story without mentioning any names, that uh, uh, they just, those people basically created another career for them after retirement talking about peak oil. And the question is, why after serving for 40 years in the oil industry, they never opened their mouth about peak oil? And then they start talking about peak oil after they left the industry. And when I asked this person why, he said, well, you don't know. If I say it, I will get fired. I said, okay, that's fine. Although there is no evidence that anyone got fired because he talked about peak oil, including uh, uh, Hubbard, who worked for Shell and wrote a couple of papers on it and had never been fired because of it. Although there are no evidence, it's the problem. You lied for 40 years. Why I have to believe you now? You had the information for 40 years. Why I have to believe you now? And the answer was, son, you are too young to understand. Sorry. That was the answer. <laughs> we have a lot of oil. So people mm -hmm. who are out there, relax. We have plenty of oil out there and enough for a very long time. And we are not going to reach peak oil, peak oil production soon. The other type is the peak oil demand, which is a hot topic today. Peak oil demand, we already heard that uh, BP and uh, others, and these are oil companies, said that peak oil demand, we reached oil demand, uh, peak oil demand in 2019 and it's over and oil is going to decline uh, after that. And then other companies and other people followed. Those who are the pro-climate change, pro-environment, uh, uh, et cetera, they basically jumped on the wagon and they start talking about the end uh, uh, of oil in terms of demand, that we don't need it. And they say, well, look, uh, uh, electric vehicles are going to take over and therefore oil demand is going to peak or it's already peaked. Well, let, let the data speak. Uh, if we look at the data, what do we see is if we change 
every single car in the EU today to electric vehicle. Every single car. That will reduce oil demand by about 7 to 8 million barrels a day. A significant amount. But to change all those cars, it will take us about 25 to 30 years. If we take the same people who are forecasting that electric cars are going to take from oil demand, the same people are saying that India's oil demand is going to grow by 7 million barrels a day by the, during the same period. So if we switch all the cars in, in the EU, India alone is going to compensate for that demand. India alone, not, we're not talking about China, we're not talking about Africa, Latin America, or any other countries. Based on my modeling, we are not going to reach peak oil demand. In fact, if we look at the outlook, and the outlook ends by 2050, so 2050, just because the end of the outlook, oil demand, global oil demand will continue to grow during the period of the outlook until 2050. Just the growth is going to be at a lower rate. And here we have to distinguish between two things here. Electric vehicles have an impact, but the impact is on oil demand growth, not on demand itself. There is a big difference between growth and demand. So they are going to reduce, so instead of growing, let's say, at a million and a half a year, probably will grow sometime down the line by 400,000 instead of 1.5. So there is an impact there, but the oil demand is not going to be reduced. And for oil demand, to stay at the 2019 level, and that's 100 million barrels a day, by 2050, we need at least 700 million, 700 million electric vehicles on the road. We are not talking about sold or anything else. On the road, we need 700 million vehicles by 2050 just to keep demand at 100 million. How efficient is that, Anas? I mean, you know, right now, it's an open secret that Tesla and Elon Musk is actually being, I mean, besides there's an issue, there's a topic I'm really interested in, but I'm looking for an expert. Like, is he with one foot in, in the military industrial complex, like, you know, under the under the, the guise of, of national security? And is he being like heavily subsidized? I mean, isn't the whole electrical vehicle industry heavily subsidized? It, it is heavily subsidized. The issue here is, once you get, and when you get to discussion with those people, there is an issue here. The moment you start talking about electric vehicle subsidies, they start talking about, oh, there are these for oil and gas, and they switch the subject. So you cannot even reach a point there. This is not the issue. There are three major issues with electric vehicles that policymakers have to deal with. Let's forget about everything else that we'll talk about. Say that electric vehicles, they are the best thing that ever existed. There are three issues. First of all, when uh, oil prices collapsed in the uh, mid-80s and oil became cheap, you would think that governments like cheap oil, like some people claim. No, because the highest taxes ever being imposed on oil, it was during the period when oil was very cheap. So governments do not want cheap oil. That's why you see that in, in some European countries, the tax on gasoline is more than three times the cost of gasoline. So instead of the price being, uh, let's say, $2, you have to pay $8. So over time, governments depended heavily on those taxes because the amount of taxes earned in states is huge. It's in billions of dollars every year. And if you switch your fleet and all your cars to electric vehicles, you are going to lose all those revenues. And look, politics and politicians is about money. That's the end of the story. If there is no money, why you want to be a politician? You cannot even control without money. So how you are going to compensate for the loss of gasoline and diesel taxes? Well, the only way you compensate is to impose taxes on electric vehicles. The only reason why they don't want to do it right now because it changes the economics completely and it tilt the economics of electric vehicles so that's number one number two we are coming into a period when we have right now we have about 13 million vehicles on the road electric vehicles over time when we reach 100 million and 200 million and 300 million as the expectations basically uh, say when we reach that level 
the number of batteries that are out there that we need to dispose of is massive. And those batteries are huge. You are talking about, uh, in terms of uh, European measurement, we are talking about probably 200, 300 kilogram battery. And highly toxic. In the uh, U.S. is 600 um, to... Could you call it like highly... Uh, highly toxic. toxic, correct. Yeah. It is highly toxic. It is highly toxic. The problem is we don't have until today kind of a very economic way to dispose of it. So there are some technologies there for uh, uh, disposal and recycling and all that stuff, but there are still expensive technologies. And in most models, these costs are not included in the cost of the electric vehicle. And the disposal, now right now in the United States, if you go and change your tires, you pay a tax on the disposal of the tire, which comes from petroleum sources. Well, right now we don't have a tax on the disposal of uh, batteries. And how to dispose of it, we don't know yet. We know for a fact that when the battery life for transportation ends, it does not mean the end of the battery because there is a second life for it. You can use it, uh, for example, get the battery and use it to, to light some streets. You can light uh, some bulbs in your garden. You can, so there is some other lives to it. But down the line, 10, 20, whenever, just choose any period. Down the line, that battery needs to be either recycled or disposed of. And we don't know what to do and we don't know who is going to pay for it until now. So policymakers still have that problem. In fact, many countries still lack regulations of that. I know some European countries already established some regulations, but we many countries don't have those regulations. The other issue, and just since we are talking about they don't have those regulations, just to give you uh, uh, an example on the hype here, there was a headline news on an African country shifting to electric vehicles. It's one of the poorest in Africa. It's just the, the, the headline and the story does not add up. So I did some investigation and I found out it was one car. One car got the headline news in that country. <laughs> and the headline was to, this, this country is switching. Okay. Well, guess what? That country does not have even a single regulation to regulate that electric car. And they need to work on their laws basically to, to, to do the regulations. But the idea here is, we still need the regulations in many countries. We need to tighten the regulations in, in others. At the same time, the technology is not cheap yet. The third point, which is boiling right now, and if you just search Google right now, you are going to see it all over the place. And yesterday I tweeted a piece of news about the United States, basically. The Biden administration, the one that blocked Keystone Pipeline because they don't want... The, to mine Alberta oil sand because it's bad for the environment. Ask, officially ask Canada to mine for rare earth metals to be used in the energy transition. This is so hypocritical, right? <laughs> this is just amazing. Absolutely. 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 And why they did that? Because they don't want to depend on China. So the third point here is the energy security issue. If you believe that the United States launched several wars because of oil, and historically they can import oil from about 20 countries, and we have about 70 countries that produce oil around the world, guess what? We produce lithium and cobalt only in five. So if oil, we launched wars, very costly wars because of oil, and we can get it from 20 countries, and we have massive amount of oil around the world, now we have little of cobalt and, and lithium, uh, what will happen next in terms of security? We're already seeing it. Uh, the United States basically is trying to shy away from China. China already asserted itself as the main producer of those minerals and the main producer of batteries. So there is this energy security aspect to it. If you add those three points together, the only logical con conclusion you reach is that, okay, electric vehicles will grow, but there will be a time when that growth, just like all demand, is going to kind of slow down and then peak. It will be slow down and peak because of policy. It started with a policy, being maintained and nourished by a policy, and it will be its growth basically will be halted by a policy.
We already have about, I think, 13 states in the United States that raised the fees for the yearly fees for registration of electric vehicles because they are using the roads and they are not paying for them. And who's going to pay for the roads? If you pick up a state like Ohio, Ohio, they have earmarked uh, uh, fuel taxes to roads and bridges. That's why the roads in Ohio are really good. And if you are uh, driving from Michigan to Ohio and just reaching and listening to the road, the moment you reach that sign, welcome to Ohio, immediately the sound of the road changes from a horrible noise to all of a sudden kind of a smooth ride. Why? Because in Michigan, they don't uh, earmark gasoline and, and diesel taxes to roads. It goes to the general budget. While in Ohio, they earmark it to the roads, so they take them all and fix the roads. Well, in Ohio, I lived in Ohio, and I can tell you there were many incidents where people will be driving on the road and there will be an Amish uh, horse, and, horse and, and, and carriage with a couple of Amish men in it or women, and they will literally slow down and force them out of the road. And you can search it and find it, that they will force the Amish out of the road. And the reason why, because they, they think that the Amish are using a road they are not paying taxes for, because they don't own cars. And this is kind of a story people in Ohio know it very well. So why it's, uh, it's forbidden for the Amish, basically, to use a horse and a carriage on a road while it's all right for electric vehicles to use it? Regardless of all this stuff about electric vehicles, the problem I have is this. How do we know this is the last vehicle and the last technology? If you really believe that the oil technology, the gasoline technology, everything else is, is, is really kind of, it will be overcome by technology, then logically you have to believe that there will be a day when there's some new technology going to come in and drive this out of business. Yeah, and this is a wonderful point now that you're making because so how do we I'm trying to transition to this question, like uh, which you made in you know during your talk with uh, with Marty Band, you said that you know the oil you know conglomerates I don't know what what we call them like the uh, oil industry has been in the last decades you know been buying. Uh, or, or silencing a lot of technologies that's been coming out. I don't know what it could be, but maybe you could you could uh, you know go a little bit into the detail. Is is it hydrogen technology or more efficient technologies, more cleaner technologies by using, you know, converting oil into whatever uh, uh, substance? Well, when you discuss these issues with environmentalists and uh, those who are pre uh, pro EVs, they use the idea that okay, you are from the oil sector. Look at oil companies, especially European companies, moving to, to where those guys are. So it's moving to the space of electric vehicles. They are moving to charging. Some of them are wind, building right now, as we speak, building windmills uh, in, the, in the ocean. These are oil companies. Uh, if you look at what Slumberjay did just a couple of days ago, they bought a lithium mine uh, uh, in Nevada or something. Uh, so... Their argument is, look, even your sector, the oil, the oil companies are moving to, the, to, to our sector. That means that's the future. Well, if you know the oil history, you know it's not the future. The point that you are trying to get to at this point, that if you study the, oil, the history of the oil companies for the last 120 years, they always try to control the technology that compete with their main business. Okay, so how many you know, how many technologies time, are there? How many technologies are there that could not make maybe the oil industry obsolete, but like you know reduce its role, or um, you know, are there any technologies out there who you might you know have have stumbled upon that you you know if they released it, it could like literally? Yeah, there are. I mean, uh, we we have. If if you look at history, we uh, the history is full of examples, and just look at the use of oil in the power sector in 1970 versus now. Look at the use of oil, sector, of, uh, oil in the industrial sector in the 70s versus now. Yes, and, and uh, we changed production lines, we changed, but one of the main factors when it comes to technology is in increasing efficiency. And we have the cafe standards, we forced uh, car pr producers and manufacturers basically to, to uh, improve the engines so they can consume 
uh, less uh, gasoline or diesel per mile. So we have all kinds of technologies to, 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 to prove it. So yes, it is. But at the same time, we should remember the following. While all this technology was going against oil, oil demand continues to go up. So how? Well, first of all, we have increase in population, but this is really not the main factor. The demand for oil is a function of urbanization. The demand of energy in general is a function of urbanization. And what's unique about this is the following. Once you urbanize, there is no way back, regardless of income, regardless of government, regardless of politics. You bring someone from the jungle to an apartment with electricity, whether his income is zero or $100 or a million dollars, he is not going to go back. So there is no way back. As you move toward energy, there is no way back. So we have this massive urbanization worldwide, and we are still in the middle of it. I mean, for God's sake, half of China is still uh, not urbanized until today. So imagine what's going to happen in the next 30, 40 years. Or India. Uh, yeah. So, or India, correct. The other side, on the other side, we have other issues that most of those people who talk about EVs and environmental issues, they miss several points. The first point is there is no substitution between oil and renewable energy in OECD countries, India and China. So when someone say, oh, you are attacking wind because you're an oil guy. No, they, I have no skin in the game at all. The fact is, look at the numbers. There is the amount of oil used to generate electricity in Europe is extremely tiny. The same thing in, in uh, India, the same thing in China, the same thing in the United States and other places. So we, we don't use that much oil. In fact, if you look at it globally, and that includes the oil producing countries because they use a lot of oil in oil generation, only 5% of that 100 million that I mentioned earlier in 2019, out of the 100 million, only 5 million is used for power generation. So what that means is if we create renewable energy to replace all of that completely, we just lose 5 million. That's it. So in a sense, the substitution globally is very, very limited. We are left only with the transportation sector to talk about and the industrial sector. For the industrial sector, are there some replacements? Yes. Like hemp and some other agricultural materials can replace some of the plastics that we are using. But still, oil is the cheapest. Natural gas is the cheapest, so that's why plastic is cheap. At the same time, what they ignore is, aside from what, what the, the factor that I mentioned earlier, what they ignore, they ignore another fact, which is they think that only the technologies they like will grow and other technologies will just stay aside. That's not correct because Bitcoin was not there and all of a sudden it's one of the biggest consumers of energy in the world. And look at uh, data centers. Before the smartphones, basically no one heard of data centers. All of a sudden, they are one of the largest consumers of energy in the world. So technology moves on all sides and improves on all sides. One of the most puzzling points I have is the following. If you look at the long-term forecast, people think it is the electric vehicles that's going to destroy the oil demand. No, that's not correct. If you look at the International Energy Agency's forecast and OPEC forecast, the most important factor is, and listen to this, is the improvement in fuel economy of internal combustion engine, gasoline and diesel. Just amazing. Yeah, this is something which... So they are talking happens, about... To be honest with you. Yeah. That there hasn't been some like fun so if you look at the numbers in technologies in the last decades or last whatever 50 Correct. years something Correct so if you look at the numbers there are some really funny issues here the first one is if they think that uh, that fuel economy is going to improve that much and you look at the numbers all of a sudden a gasoline engine with that fuel economy they are talking about in the future is better than electric car for the environment. 
So why we are going for electric cars if you think we are going to go that way? So there is a fundamental problem in the forecast. But there is a reason why they have that forecast. And the reason is these are international agencies, and they have members. Like the IEA has 30 members. OPEC has 13 members. And then they have friends and uh, others who are cooperating with them. So let's say uh, a country like the UK basically told them, okay, here is our plans. We already approved those laws, and that's the new laws, and that's the new policy. The IEA is take that policy as is and do the modeling based on the policy and the objectives of the government. You cannot tell them, oh, by the way, sorry, we have doubts about uh, the success of your policy. Well, they are paying members. You cannot tell them that. So people are missing this point that those international organizations are taking members' policies as is without questioning them. Only us, independent analysts, can do that work. And the irony here is, and I tweeted about uh, this a couple of days ago, that we have thousands and thousands of books and articles and academic papers for the last hundred years that talk about government policy failure. And all of a sudden, the embedded assumption in those outlooks and what people who support uh, more EVs and more renewable energy, they really assume complete perfect success of government policy, which contradict everything we know in politics and economics. So we have a serious problem there. So they ignore the fact that oil is not a, does not compete with renewables. They ignore that technologies move all at the same time. And always we have improvement in supply. We have improvement in demand too, but in terms of technology, just to give you a kind of a fact so people can realize what's going on. When you talk about disruptive technology, for the electric vehicles, if we consider that as disruptive technology, it will take the uh, uh, electric vehicles about 30 years to replace about seven to eight million barrels a day of oil. Seven to eight. Well, guess what? The share revolution brought in online eight million barrels a day in 10 years. So the question is, which one is more disruptive? That's where they ignore the role of technology. They ignore economics in several ways. For example, we already have enough evidence to show that what Putin wanted in Europe is to show that Russia is a reliable energy supplier. Every single statement and policy we've studied basically in the past proves this point. And any disruptions came from other countries. It did not come from Russia. Russia did not disrupt the supplies of gas to Europe. It was Ukraine and other countries that halted the supplies. And when there was a competition for the gas, what the Russians did, they lowered the price of the gas. So they are ignoring the reaction of the producers. That when you put those producers in the corner, they're going, they are going to react. And those reactions, basically, since they are being ignored, they are going to have tremendous impact on the market because it's going to hit the market so hard. And we are going to end up with energy crisis as a result of that. So Russia, for example, if they feel threatened, they are going to lower the gas prices in Europe and they are going to maintain their share. And speaking about Russian gas, one of the most ironic facts is the following, that take the queen of green energy, Germany. Today, Germany's dependence on fossil fuel is 75%. Despite all the spending and all the talk, Netherlands, 90%. And if you look throughout Europe, you find out that the, least, the countries that are least dependent on fossil fuel are France and Norway. And outside OECD, you have Brazil. Those are the least dependent. Why? Well, Norway because of hydro, not because of solar and wind. France because of nuclear, not because of solar and wind. 
and Brazil because of the ethanol, not because of solar and wind. So let's be practical about it. If we want to reduce Germany's dependence from 75% to levels of Norway, okay, the amount, we need trillions of dollars to reach that objective. And we need a whole change in global economics and politics to reach that objective. So talking of ignoring the reaction of producers, I have a presentation that is a one slide presentation. It's one hour presentation, only one slide, and it has pictures of four animals. And I wish I have it, I would have shared it uh, here, uh, prepared it in advance. I think uh, the idea I, here is- I saw it on your website uh, that, uh, or somewhere on Twitter, I'm not sure where I saw that, but I saw that I think on your website somewhere. Okay, yes, I can't find it. it uh, I, I did. Uh, Correct. I did share some uh, presentations uh, on, on the web, and probably it was in them. But uh, there are the pictures of four animals summing up the behavior of all producers in the face of hype for the last 40 years. And it starts with a picture of a lion. And lion means that you don't care about anyone else. You just do what you do best and produce oil, and that's it, and ignore all the hype about shale or renewable energy or the EVs, etc. We've seen that behavior from time to time in various countries. The second one is the rabbit behavior. The rabbit behavior is you just believe every, everything being told in the Western press and you just run away and say, I'm going to sell my oil at any price. I'm going to produce at maximum, sell my oil, whatever the price is, and just run away. And the uh, third one is the tiger reaction. The tiger reaction basically is you attack. This is what I just mentioned before, before the segment, that like Putin, for example, just lowering gas prices in Europe and just killing all the LNG imports, for example. Or the Saudis just crashing the oil market. That's the tiger attack. We've seen that behavior. But the most important one for the future is the fox. The fox behavior is very interesting and very intriguing and uh, people are not paying attention to it. Saudis basically, in particular, are taking all those threats seriously. I say, okay, you don't want my oil. That is fine. I am going to work on new technologies where, why you don't want my oil? You want to build electric vehicles? I want to make sure that the body of the electric vehicle and all the seats and everything in it is made from my oil. So I'm going to convert my oil to materials. I'm going to export my oil to you embedded in something else. And if you are going to build those windmills, I will make sure that the blades and the tower and the cement and everything is made by my oil. What that means is when those countries started, in a sense, guaranteeing demand for their oil using domestic industries, that will export materials to overseas, there will be a time when we are going to end up with government policy failure in the West, where they are not going to deliver the promised decline in demand for oil. And then they need that oil. But that oil is no longer there. Not because it's not underground, like we talked earlier about the peak uh, uh, production. No, simply because there is no additional investment there. And that oil that exist already being converted to materials. And what's unique about this is this. Supposedly, by that time, oil is so cheap. That means the materials made out of it is so cheap, it will compete with any other material made out of any other things. So all of a sudden, those countries are achieving their objective of economic diversification and shifting their exports and money and uh, income Okay, and they are making a lot of profit because oil and gas is so cheap at that time. The only way to get their uh, crude is to pay them the price of crude plus the profit they make out of those factories. Yeah, I mean that price is going to be very high. Unless, and that me... will lead us to another important point. I yeah. think. Go ahead. Now I just want to want to transition a little bit. That will lead us to a very mm -hmm. Just final point on my side. Yeah. Um, there, there was an article in uh, many news uh, uh, outlets basically 
produced news stories out of it that uh, the Gulf countries are going to have serious problems in the future because of the energy transition. They are not going to have enough money, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That article and those stories basically are nonsense. And the reason why, because we can end up with very high prices, even with lower demand and supply. So the idea that lower demand is going to lead to permanently lower prices is nonsense because lower prices are going to reduce quantity supplied and then producers who are uh, high cost producers are going to exit the market and then prices go up again. So the idea that those countries are going to suffer is a complete nonsense because of their reaction shifting oil to materials and because of the fact that it's a pure economics that even with lower demand, you could end up with higher uh, uh, prices. It's a fan f fascinating insight. So Anas, uh, let me, because you repeatedly said uh, also on uh, your, one of your or many interviews or on Twitter or uh, in your statements that, um, you know, the dollar is not going to go away. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, uh, oil is being traded in dollar because I want to somehow transition to Bitcoin. Like wh what would happen? Like what, what could happen if uh, during the you know, process of hyper Bitcoinization, uh, Bitcoin would become not only, you know, a global reserve asset and a store of value, but medium exchange and unit of account. Um, and now you said, uh, you know, uh, oil is can only and is only being traded in dollars, but the revenues can be somehow done through whatever currency. Um, what what would right. what would need to happen in order to you know to go away from the dominating international reserve currency, which is the U.S. dollar? Okay. Uh, generally speaking, let me explain to the audience uh, one one point that uh, we don't have any incidents in the world where oil is priced in any other currency. We don't have a single incident. All the incidents being mentioned basically are being confused between revenues being uh, received in other currencies versus pricing. Pricing oil has always been priced in dollar and is still priced in dollar. Saddam Hussein did not price his oil in dollar. He received the revenues in euros. Uh, Iran, Venezuela, uh, etc. Oil remains priced in dollar. Someone might say, oh, look at China. They have uh, a yuan-based uh, uh, um, uh, exchange and therefore they are pricing in it. No, because if you look at the data and you adjust for the time of the trade, the price in yuan is the Dubai price in dollar. So it just kind of you are translating, in a sense, this to this. That's it. So oil is priced in dollar. And there is a reason why OPEC continued to price oil in dollar. For those who are interested, they can search my name plus uh, dollar OPEC or something, some combination of those words. They can find uh, a detailed article on this explaining why OPEC continues to price its oil in dollar. There are several reasons why, and those characteristics of the dollar do not exist in any other currency and they do not exist in Bitcoin. And therefore, we will continue to price oil in dollar. But to back to your point, that those countries can choose and tell their customers, well, don't pay me in dollars, pay me in Bitcoin, pay me in the Euro, pay me in Yuan, pay me in whatever they agree on. And sometimes might end up with barter because that's what Iran and Turkey and China basically and Russia have been doing that, okay, and instead of money, just, just send me some wheat or some whatever <laughs> equipment I need. Uh, uh, so, the, the, the value of the oil could be in anything and it could be in crypto. The problem we are having right now with Bitcoin is that the last thing an oil producer wants is a very volatile currency because this is one of the things that attracted them to the dollar that still relatively more stable over time than other currencies despite the continuous decline in real value. Uh, so the, And then you have the liquidity issue. Oil is the largest traded commodity on earth. So you need a lot of liquidity and that liquidity does not exist anywhere else. At the same time, uh, if you uh, look at, for example, uh, it, the countries that have been using it right now are all embargoed countries, which means that when, when countries given a choice, they are still using the dollar regardless in this case. So we still way, we have still way to go to, to start talking about even getting the revenues uh, in, in uh, Bitcoin or others uh, over time. 
because of this high volatility. So this continuous growth in the price of Bitcoin, basically, it goes against it in using it in pricing. And, and until it is stabilized, uh, we cannot even talk about using it to price something. Even if it comes to a sort of an inflationary, you know, scenario, uh, you know, with all the U.S. Federal Reserve and the central banks printing trillions and trillions of money, and you know, uh, I mean, do you see like an inflation? Uh, inflation let me mention. Uh, yes, basically, we have. Uh, I mean, we have a couple of issues here. Uh, probably before we talk about inflation, the the biggest issue we are facing right now is because of corona all of a sudden the government sector and the public sector all of a sudden dominating almost every country in the world so we have more government inter intervention more government control than ever which is a serious problem and those who are talking about climate change they can see this control and say well i can jump on the wagon and make that transition to the to to the new low carbon economy or no carbon zero or neutrality or whatever you want to call it using this power of the government and they are trying they are pushing the government basically since you are doing this and you are paying so you can put the conditions well the first comment here is if that energy transition is really valuable and is market driven why you are asking the government to to control and intervene just kind of a simple fact but the issue here is everyone is jumping on the wagon on the other side, basically, to have more control. The problem is with all this massive spending on stimulus and even buying the, uh, the vaccine and others, uh, theoretically, you have to end up with, with, um, with inflation unless you, the other side, which is the demand side, just collapses and you end up with more problems. But the idea here is inflation, and you already spent that money, and debt is going through the roof. It means one thing. It means higher taxation. So you are going to end up with slower economic growth, higher taxation, inflation, and most likely higher unemployment. And the question is, how long that lasts? And that's my argument with the oil producing countries. Is if you believe the hype right now, and we end up with inflation, taxation, and uh, high unemployment, the change in those countries is coming. So don't jump on the wagon right now, and then they are going to dump you out of the wagon one more time. So we have a serious problem there. The second point is OPEC as an organization and the countries of OPEC struggled with the role of inflation in reducing the purchasing power of oil since the early 70s. And they've done several studies, and they suffered greatly, and they come up with several scenarios, et cetera. And uh, they, they concluded at the end, look, I have to stick to the dollar because there is no other choice. And I have to literally, uh, in a sense, bite my tongue and take that inflation. The idea that this inflation is going to lead to higher oil prices is kind of question. I have many people on Twitter basically replying to me, say inflation is going to get it to 100. No, uh, this is still a question. We don't know. We know that people are going to jump onto currencies and they are going to jump onto uh, um, metals and minerals and real estate in case of inflation. Yes, that's going to have an impact, but uh, oil has its own things too. And, and we got to be very careful with the idea of linking inflation to oil prices. We have a couple of problems with uh, oil right now that while we have a surplus right now, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, that that surplus is temporary. We don't have enough investment to maintain all demand in the future. With all the factors I mentioned about the failure of government policy on the green uh, energy part, we need more oil than all the expectations we, we are hearing uh, today. So we are going to end up with a shortage. That shortage is going to increase oil prices. It might quite side with the inflation and then some people will say see i told you look inflation and higher prices well we still have fundamentals basically here at uh, uh at play and then uh, the other issue is for the first time in in the oil industry history we have a buyer who is in china this never happened before 
And the reason why it is important because China bought massive amount of oil when oil was very cheap and they stored it. And we don't know the exact amount of that. But we already have seen this behavior before. Once oil prices reach $75 or $80, they are going to use their SPR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserves, dump it on the market at lower prices. The problem with that is it is like a double-edged sword. Because once they start dumping that storage, Chinese demand decreases and Chinese imports decreases while they are increasing supply. So it's coming from both sides. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on prices. So the idea of getting to 100 is extremely difficult in this environment. To conclude this point, basically, is OPEC, OPEC Plus, with the leadership of Saudi Arabia, they can affect the, 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 the floor and raise it. But they cannot determine the ceiling. China is going to determine that ceiling. So in a sense, we are sandwiched between OPEC and China. And the maximum probably will be an $80 uh, oil. We cannot go above that. And on the bottom, I don't think that uh, oil producers are going to let prices decline below, below 40. So the range... Uh, basically, is 40 to 80 in this case. In terms of uh, Bitcoin, uh, again, they can ask for it in terms of revenues. It cannot be used for various reasons uh, in oil uh, pricing. Should the situation change over time, uh, we can talk about it then. Uh, but at this stage, it, it, it does not look like uh, cryptocurrency will be in the offing for pricing oil. Um, okay. Uh, if Bitcoin, I mean, do you see Bitcoin, like, you know, when you see like corporations, institutions, and now it's becoming more mainstream and the mass adoption gaining momentum. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin is a deflationary money, you know, it's increasing, it would be like, as, as, you, as a medium exchange unit account, it would, it would, it would increase in purchasing power. Uh, do you, I mean, have you thought about like, what kind of scenarios could play out? I don't want to get into the currency issues uh, simply because I know there are better experts to talk about how it is going to be used. And whatever opinion, I would say just kind of a personal uh, uh, opinion. But I think the most interesting part of the Bitcoin is the link between Bitcoin and the oil and gas industry and the energy industry. I think there is link on several fronts. And as you heard in the news that uh, many uh, Bitcoin uh, mining operations are moving to the oil fields themselves to benefit from the flared gas, uh, et cetera. And the irony is the moment they move there, all of a sudden we heard the Greens saying, oh, you can come and, and use uh, wind at night and uh, use uh, solar during the day and you can use this. It's kind of free because it's blowing at night and there is no use of it. They are missing the point. <laughs> a Bitcoin miner need a consistent, reliable source of energy. You cannot tell them just come in and, and operate during the day and sleep during the night. Uh, and, and as you know, they invest massive amount of money in those machines. Uh, so they are, so the, the movement uh, to, to the oil fields, basically, to benefit from the natural gas, especially the, the flirt by natural gas, is simply based on the idea that it is a reliable source 24 7. Exactly. And the side That's effect would be in. like, you know, a clean, environmentally clean and efficient, you know, uh, Bitcoin mining technology, right? I mean, the flared gas or whatever it gas. Well, the idea here is correct. So, flaring gas basically, well, with gas, we have two issues. The first thing is gas is methane. And if you don't flare it, uh, this is a potent gas. So, it has very bad impact on the greenhouse uh, gases, et cetera. Uh, that's why they flare it because the impact is less and you end up with CO2. So the idea is you are saving that CO2. It's not happening by converting that gas to electricity and electricity being used in Bitcoin. So in a sense, Bitcoin, and the reason why it's flared because there are no pipelines to take it to the market. So Bitcoin mining just moved in and say, you know what, I can save you. And because they are at the wellhead, the cost is really small relative to the rest of the market. And do you see more countries can coming long -term in? Long-term contracts and everyone. Will... Do you see more countries? Sorry? Like whatever. Do you see more countries coming in and you know? Absolutely, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Would it be Iran or absolutely. Saudi Arabia fact, or any other Arabic countries? Well, uh, okay. 
uh, Saudi Arabia does not flare gas. Uh, mm -hmm. they, are, they, they are one of the, uh, they were on the forefront for a long time ago that they got their gas system and they don't flare any gas uh, at all, only for temporary reasons if they are developing something. Uh, so that's not the case for Saudi Arabia, but it is the case for other countries uh, in the region where you end up with either Bitcoin mining or data centers. Because at the end, in those countries, the use of smartphones and computers, etc., is is widespread, and you, you need those data centers. In fact, if you look at Saudi Arabia in particular, data centers are a big part of the Vision 2030, and they are going to be a big energy consumer. So the idea here is kind of Bitcoin move, uh, moving to to the oil fields is opening the eyes of other industries to move into, including data centers and probably just like we we got bitcoin and we got data centers we did not know about it 20 30 years ago probably some new industries will come in as a result once people realize they can get cheap gas let me ask you one more question i don't want to take up too much time uh, on us um, you, uh, when it comes to you know national security or military industrial complex how i mean how dependent is saudi arabia or any other country in those regions uh, you know, upon the military forces of the United States? And can Bitcoin be sort of a solution, a transition to a more, you know, balanced, peaceful uh, world order? Um, uh, uh, okay. Um, um, we, we are talking here, I'm going to talk about uh, politics in particular. Uh, no, Bitcoin is not going to have any impact in this case, because if you look at, what happened between the United States and Iraq. Iraq went into Kuwait, invaded Kuwait, occupied Kuwait. Then the United States with other 27 countries built a coalition, kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. There was a debate at that time in the Bush senior administration on should we go to Baghdad or stay at the border? And they decided to stay on the border because they thought sanctions will work. And it was one of the toughest sanctions you'll ever see in history. And it did not work. And then George Bush Jr., in a sense, George W. Bush, came to the conclusion, rightly, came to the conclusion that the source of power of Saddam Hussein is the money coming from the oil resource itself. And therefore, the United States have to occupy the oil resources itself to prevent Saddam Hussein from getting the revenues. And the idea is, if I control the oil fields, there is no business for Saddam Hussein to stay in power. All he got to do is just leave. Because he cannot pay his soldiers, he cannot pay his guards. But of course, they went farther and they went to Baghdad and you know the, the rest of the story. But the idea here is the control of the reserves themselves mean the control of the flow of oil. And those who control the flow of oil in a country control the destiny of that country. It has nothing to do with whatever currency he used. It's about that flow of oil. And therefore, the justification for George W. Bush is this justification, that the control of the oil, which is the main source of power of the enemy, will strip the enemy of that power. Now I control it. I don't need it for my own use because I have a lot of oil and it's not good for my energy security. But what I can do is use the revenues of what I control to build the government of my liking in Iraq. And that's exactly what happened. So the United States did not go to Iraq because of its thirst for Iraqi oil. The control of oil has a strategic purpose and has nothing to do with the currency. And those who are claiming because Saddam Hussein asked uh, to switch his revenues to euro and the United States punished him for that, that's absolutely not correct because it was the United States that the switch to euro. Wonderful. Um, so, Anas, one final question uh, regarding, you know, disruptive technologies. I mean, when it comes to transportation, just to, because oil is not going to go away, you know, it's going to be used for a lot, for a very, very, very long time. But do you see like any shift, like uh, in like evolutionary shift in transportation technologies, you know, when it comes to, because when you, when you, when you, when we look at the science of the technology in the last hundred years, there hasn't been really, you know, we're still using combustion engines and, you know, uh, conventional 
additional propulsion systems and burning fuel. Do you see that? I mean, uh, are there, do you think other, or do you know of any technologies that are somehow, uh, you know, not really publicly dis accessible at, at the moment, but, you know, possessed uh, with or through patents or whatever uh, by, you know, these conglomerates? If you look at all the technologies that been invented and they became widespread worldwide in an unbelievable way where the adoption basically was almost like uh, up, straight up over, over time. And you study each of those technologies, you find out the following. The first thing is the value added from the new technology is priceless which means that the move from a horse and carriage to a car, that move is priceless. You cannot even put a price on it. The move from a land phone to a smartphone is priceless, literally priceless. The second characteristic is that all those technologies that became adopted worldwide, even if you go to the jungles of Africa right now, you will see people with cell phones using some international service because there is no service in their country. Why? Because it gives people mobility and freedom. That is also priceless. So between mobility and freedom, all the technology we adopted, they have those characteristics. It's priceless on one side, and it gives them freedom and mobility. Because the smartphone gives us more and more mobility, just more, more than what we can imagine. Uh, so if you look at those technologies, it is about priceless transi transition, and at the same time, it gives us that freedom uh, and, and mobility. Well, really, those new technologies, what kind of addition they give me in terms of the same electricity I get. So I'm sitting in my home. I don't care whether that light is turned on by natural gas or coal or nuclear or uh, wind, etc. So there's no value added for me. At the same time, if you look at electric vehicles, it's not only that I, it, there is no value added, probably small value added. I have a problem because now if I have to drive from Dallas to, let's say, uh, New York, I have to sit down for more than one hour to drive, to kind of draft my way to make sure that I have uh, 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 charging stations on the road to make sure that I'm going to charge the road. If I am driving my gasoline car, I will never even ask. I will never even think of it. So in a sense, it's affecting my freedom in one way or the other. Now, those who support EVs, they say, well, uh, moving to a low carbon economy is, uh, is pri priceless. Well, let's convince uh, the rest of the world with that idea. In fact, I, I really liked uh, one, uh, uh, it, I think it was in, in South Africa when uh, uh, a journalist was talking to a farmer and he told him that his land is going to be flooded because of global warming. And it seemed like there was a prayer discussion on, on climate change. And the farmer said, look, I would rather die rich from climate change than to die poor the way I am. So I'm going to die anyway. Let me die rich. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea here is, yes, you could be convinced, but can you convince the world the same way we convince the world with adoption of cars or, 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 or smartphones? Yeah. And that's where the point is. Wow, that, that was really super, very fascinating uh, conversation, um, Anas. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Do you have any final thoughts or where pe people can find you or in the links, resources, anything coming up? Uh, th th thank you very much. It was, it was a pleasure. Uh, basically, the best way to reach me is via my Twitter account, which is my first name, my last name, at uh, Anas Alhaji, A-N-A-S-A-L-H-A-J-J-I. I have a website with the same, uh, with the same name, too they can reach me and I'll be happy to answer their questions or communicate with them. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I hope, you know, we can repeat this sometime in You're the welcome. future. Okay. All right. Have a great day. And thank you so anytime, much. Anytime. Anytime. Have Bye. a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow. That was something. Okay. How did you enjoy this? If you have any questions, comments, let me know. Um, and sub uh, make sure you follow Anas on, on Twitter. It's really very insightful comments. Uh, it's, it's like a super expertise on, on all these like oil market, energy market, uh, disruptive technologies. 
um, the, also like you know what what what, what should I call it? geopolitics macroeconomically he has a really uh, good uh, even though he admits you know on some questions that he can't maybe answer them and leaves it up to others but it was really insightful especially I wanted to take have his take like the connection between Bitcoin Bitcoin you know hyper Bitcoinization uh, disruptive technologies and what it can you know what what it can trigger what it can cause in the conventional energy market in the transportation technology so let me know what you think and make sure you like follow share retweet and subscribe to my youtube channel and my podcast platforms thank you so much again and i'll see you soon bye